My name is Dave Ripplinger, a bioenergy economic specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, welcome to our December edition of the Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar. Uh, again, we've been doing this monthly uh, since COVID-19 hit uh, in, in March of, of 2020. I uh, have a series of presentations. I actually have quite a few today. Um, one thing to note, uh, Frayne Olson will have to leave us. So if you have any questions for Frayne, uh, please share them uh, as he's talking and we'll try and get to those uh, before he has to leave us. Uh, but with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Brian Parman, our first speaker for today. Hey, thank you, Dave. Um, and yeah, I, I guess this is going to be our last uh, presentation of the year uh, of these uh, Situation and Outlook webinars. So thanks for everyone for joining us. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on uh, as far as production costs, and I've covered those in previous webinars quite a bit. And I'll hit those again as we kick off uh, 2022 and see where we kind of sit with that. But today I kind of wanted I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the uh, macro data that's come out uh, recently, specifically like today's jobs reports and the inflation uh, uh, inflation data that we're seeing. And of course, inflation is is probably going to have somewhat of an impact on production costs as well. So my first slide um, shows that infl inflation number uh, that, that just came out uh, last month from the previous month. And all uh, for this, uh, this number basically says there was a, for all prices or all goods, 6.2% uh, inflation uh, over the 12 month period ending uh, in, in October, ending at the end of October. So information coming out after that. And all, uh, all items except food or energy rose 4.6% which is the largest increase, the largest price increase since August of 1991, so almost 30 years. So one of the, the biggest 12 month period of inflation in about 30 years. And uh, speaking of uh, food and energy, my next slide shows what food prices actually did uh, for, the, for, the last, for that 12 month period. And they were up 5.3%, which is a fairly high jump, but actually uh, lower than the, overall inflation rate, which was a uh, 6.2%. And my next slide shows why uh, that is, and that's because energy prices. Energy prices over that 12 month period were up 30%. So again, overall inflation, 6.2%. Uh, Core inflation, as they call it, was 4.6%, which excludes food and energy because of the, uh, the volatility in those uh, two, two items. But energy prices have just been really high uh, over that period. And, and, the, and as well as other items, it's just energy at 30% um, kind of kind of dwarfs everything else. So that's been the, the, a key driver of some of the inflation. And I think everyone's well aware of that. But the fact is, it's, it's just been a, a, a long year as far as uh, prices and their march upward. And I'll be talking probably later on at the beginning of the year or uh, January, February time frame on perhaps some inflationary impacts on uh, production costs. The other report that came out, and this came out just this morning, is uh, initial jobless claims down to 184,000. And so I'm showing this chart from the St. Louis Federal Reserve, and what it shows is initial jobless claims, and those typically had hung around historically 200, 250,000 on the low end, but 184,000 is the lowest it's been since the 1960s, actually. So a very low initial jobless claims report. And when you consider that when the pandemic hit, it was close to six, seven million initial jobless claims in a week. Uh, that's a that's a very low number. And then my next slide, uh, sh you know, shows the uh, uh, continuous jobless claims. So you got initial jobless claims, which are newly filing for unemployment. Continuous claims are people who are having trouble finding a job for several weeks and they continue applying for it. And it's right around one point nine million people, which is just barely just above pre pandemic levels. Uh, which were, you know, closer to 1.7, 1.8. So that's getting back down to where it was uh, pre-pandemic as well. And unemployment overall has fallen to about 4.2%, according to the BLS. That's the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is approaching that pre-pandemic level of just before, just below 4%. It was around 3.8 or so. So as far as the these the metrics of employment and uh, uh, unemployment, uh, those numbers are basically reflecting where we were prior to uh, COVID. That the, those numbers, most folks are are pretty uh, pretty satisfied with. But my next slide kind of puts all uh, brings into focus exactly what we're 
thinking about and concerned about, and I know that uh, consumers are concerned about is how long is this inflation um, situation that we're in going to linger? I mean, because it basically has for a year. And, you know, the question is, will the Fed need to take action? And I, I put in parentheses the word sooner, because they already have said they're going to be tapering and maybe accelerate the the tapering of the uh, quantitative easing that they've been doing um but if this inflation rate persists if we just keep seeing these um inflation numbers hang around is the fed going to take action or are they kind of laying it at the feet of supply chain issues driving higher prices up uh or do they think monetary policy is going to be necessary and then the other question when you think about interest rates okay inflation a lot of times, uh, if you think about interest, it has to stay higher than the rate of inflation in order for anyone doing any lending to actually make a make any money outside of the fees. I mean, you got the fees, but then you have have the interest rate as well. And if inflation, let's say, is seven, eight, nine percent per year and the interest rates two percent per year, by the end of a 10 year loan, I'm paying back with dollars that are worth significantly less than I borrowed them for uh, at an interest rate below the inflation rate. So, you know, I guess that's a, that's a question going into this. Is there going to be uh, any changes in interest rates? Because right now they stay fairly, fairly low. And is the Fed going to take any action? And then the other question is on the employer side, because we just saw that unemployment is very low. So we've got all these open jobs right now. But for the most part, folks have filled them who wanted them with this low unemployment rate. So how are employers going to adjust to this great resignation as it's been termed where folks exited the workforce and are you know maybe not likely to return even as wages keep creeping up uh, are they are they unlikely to return uh i did a talk about this i i believe uh, a few few sessions ago uh, a few webinars ago on discussing you know has there been a permanent shift in the labor force and i think that there has we had some folks retire who maybe weren't planning to retire due to COVID and they're not coming back. They figured out how to make it work. And then other folks who went down to single income and exited the workforce to uh, deal with uncertainty of childcare and things like that. And are they coming back? Um, you still go around the, the city of Fargo, other cities around the nation, in other states, a lot of businesses having trouble filling open jobs. You drive by a lot of the hospitality and, and uh, food service uh, establishments and they all say we're hiring jobs available here competitive benefits etc cetera, etc cetera, doing all they can to incentivize people to apply and it's you know it's been slow and with such a with the unemployment rate fairly low it begs the question are there enough workers out there to actually fill these fill these needs or are employers going to have to adjust and figure figure something else out so those are the questions as far as the macro economy goes that are on my mind headed into 2022 and how and essentially just kind of trying to figure out how we're going to uh, how we're going to uh, basically deal with those two situations is uh, is going to be key. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Frayne Olson, who is our next speaker. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, again, I apologize. I do have a, another session going on that I'm going to have to leave a little bit early from this one. So as I'm going through, if there are some questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box uh, or the, or the uh, Q&A function, and we'll try and get those answered. If not, please, here's my contact information. I'd be happy to try and visit with you or send an email, and I'll try and answer your questions best I can. So my first slide is just a summary of the uh, supply and demand estimates from today's report. It was uh, actually released at 11 o'clock today. Um, I wanted to compare the the results from the report relative to what the trade was expecting. Um, typically, the December report doesn't have a lot of surprises in it. Um, this is also one of those cases where it was a very neutral, I guess, on, on wheat, slightly negative report. So the, the uh, row on the very top is the average trade estimate uh, from the private analysts and, and, and traders that do forecasting. Um, what their average expectation was for the USDA report today. So uh, news agencies like Reuters and Bloomberg will survey these analysts and ask them, what do you expect the numbers to be? So we kind of use that as the benchmark as to measure against what we actually got. So if we look at the top row highlighted in black, that's what the trade was expecting to see. If you look in the highlighted row on the very bottom, 
in red. That's the numbers we got today. Um, so very little changes. The corn and soybean numbers were unchanged, basically left unchanged from the, from the November report. Um, the wheat number, the ending stocks did increase slightly. Um, but again, that was spread out across several different classes of wheat. So not major changes, not major adjustments, but some small refinements. Next slide is actually the same information summarized for the South American production estimate. So as we move forward in time now, as we get our U.S. crop kind of in the bin and figure out how many bushels we have, now attention is really shifting to uh, weather and yield forecasts and production estimates coming out of South America. That combined obviously with the Chinese buying just because they are such large buyers of both U.S. corn and, and as well as U.S. soy. So if we look at what is the trade expecting for yields and total, more importantly, total production coming out of South America, both Argentina and Brazil, the highlighted black row on top provides what the trade was expecting to see. So again, these are private analysts putting together their in own information. On the very bottom, highlighted in red, is the current USDA forecast for South American production. So as you see, you compare the top one with the bottom one, uh, relatively small changes, no big shifts. Again, this is not a surprising number. The reason I'm going to go through this is as we move forward in time, especially as we get into January and February, um, these numbers are going to become critically important to price movements for not only corn, but also for soybeans. So a couple notes, a couple things to remember, um, and, and I'll show you some maps in just a moment, but Brazil has had a very early planting progress. They started the planting season earlier than normal this year, and they've had a very rapid planting progress. Okay, so right now, most of the, most of the private analysts are saying Brazil is basically done planting soybeans. The last report I had was, you know, 98, 99% planted. So Brazil is essentially done with their, their soybeans and their first crop corn. I'll show you some, some graphics in just a moment. Brazil um, is about half, I mean, Argentina, excuse me, is about halfway through their corn and soybean planting progress. So uh, again, um, we're, we're a little bit ahead of normal plant planting, which tends to lead towards expectations of above average yields. As we start looking forward in time, the other, the other numbers I want you to compare would be the blue numbers, the highlighted blue numbers, which was the estimate for last year's production and all of this is in million metric ton versus the red. So now let's compare the blue versus the red. So last year's production for Argentina as well as Brazilian corn and soybeans were lower than this year's expectation. So both Argentina and Brazil are expected to increase the total available supplies of corn and beans for a couple different reasons. In Argentina, they had some very heavy drought conditions last year. Their average yields were below normal. Today, the numbers that you see out of Argentina are basically using a trend line yield. So they're assuming that we're gonna look at the change or shift in planted acreage, apply a trend line yield, and what do we think the, the total production will be? So you can start to compare first Argentina and now more importantly, Brazil. And I really want you to look at the Brazilian numbers for corn at about 86 million metric ton last year versus 118 million metric ton this year very substantial increase from last year. Again, last year's Brazil corn crop was impacted, negatively impacted by some drought conditions later on in the, in the season, in the growing season, which again, reduced their supplies. Well, if Brazil has the kind of crop that people are expecting today, those corn supplies, and again, a large portion of the Brazilian corn crop is exported and competes against US exports, is going to have an impact on the timing and potentially pricing of corn in the global markets. I also want you to focus in and zero in on the production numbers for soybeans. Last year, Brazil had a record soybean crop of 138 million metric ton. The USDA is forecasting 144 million metric ton. Most of the trade analysts that I've read, at least looking forward, are, are really projecting between a 140 or a 145. To put that in perspective, this year's crop out of the US, which was basically a record, we tied our old record or slightly exceeded it, 
was at about 120 or 121 million metric ton. So when you start looking at a 6 million metric ton increase just out of Brazil alone, and then we add in about an, another 3 million metric ton increase from Argentina on the soybean side, the globe is going to have plenty of soybeans available if these crops and the crop potential actually is fulfilled. So these numbers, I want to review them quickly, but I want you to start thinking about these numbers and listening as you're listening to the kind of the market analysts and you're listening to the radio reports or reading articles. These are the numbers we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about over the next several months. So my next slide is just provides a map of where are soybeans produced in Brazil. I've shown this before, I just want to refresh your memories. And the reason this becomes important is because as we start talking about weather and weather conditions and soil moisture conditions, we have to realize Brazil is a very large country, just like the United States. So you can have a drought in one area and you can have surplus moisture or flooding in another area, and you can have fantastic yields in another area. So think about what happened here in the US where the Western Corn Belt was on the dry side. The Eastern Corn Belt had a fantastic year. We came out with basically an average crop. So you can't just throw the entire Brazilian crop into one big bucket and say, well, this is where we're at. You do have to think about the different growing regions and the different zones. So the darker the green, the more bushels or more tons of soybeans that are produced. You can see kind of in the, in the upper left-hand corner there, Mato Grosso. That's obviously that great big soybean producing state. We spend a lot of time talking about that region. However, the growing region for soybean in Brazil is much larger than that. And, and what happens in central and southern Brazil is equally as important to what happens in Mato Grosso. So we can't get too focused on one particular area. All right, so on this map, I just want you to geographically notice on the right-hand side, we have that little bubble or bulge out on the side that goes into the Atlantic Ocean. So I want as a reference point, if you take kind of the lower part of that bulge and go straight across, that's kind of the northern end of the growing region for, for, uh, for soybeans. Now my next slide shows the exact same thing only for corn. Next slide, please. Oop, there we go, that one. So if you look on the right-hand side, if you look at the map on the right-hand side, that's where corn is produced in Brazil. Now that is what's, what's called the second crop or safrina crop of corn. Notice that the corn area and the soybean area I just showed you are very, very similar. So what's happened now in the Northern growing regions, they plant soybeans right now. They, they, after the harvest of soybeans, they come back and start planting corn. So the increase in corn acreage has primarily been to try and break up some disease problems because of almost growing continuous soybeans for so long. But that's called the second crop or safrina crop. That's not gonna be planted until we get into this January, February time period as the soybeans are being harvested in, the, in northern, northern Brazil. So the safrina crop, the second crop, or the, what they call the winter crop is about 75% of their total production. So that's really the big crop in volume. If we look on the left-hand side, the map on the left-hand side shows what's called the first crop corn. So this would be like Iowa, corn, soybeans. You're planting corn and soybeans at the same time. And, and you've got this rotation from year to year to year. Notice that on the first crop, which is about 25% of the, of the production, is towards the southern end of the growing region. So Mato Grosso doesn't have a lot of first crop uh, corn because they're planting soybeans. The reason I'm going through this is the first crop season will be starting harvest about in that January, February time period. So about the time that the corn harvest starts in the south, the corn planting will start in the north. So corn in Brazil is a little more complex. When we think about the corn export season, the ability of Brazil to be able to export corn into the global market, we have these two seasons. And the southern part of Brazil is also where they have these short line railroads, where the, the feeder system from the farm into an export terminal is relatively short and pretty efficient. So a lot of the first crop corn is harvested and is exported into the international market. The second crop, 
the the call the the map on the right in particular like in Mato Grosso a lot of that corn in the northern region stays domestically that's the corn that's used for internally in the country for their for their livestock sector and some of their ethanol so the exports of corn and the corn volumes available are typically in the southern part of Brazil so we have a first crop where we tend to get a lot of exports we have the second crop where again we can extend that export season a little bit longer because of the corn grown in the south. The corn grown in Mato Grosso typically does not hit an export market just because of the distance that it has to be, has to be transported. So coming back to weather, when we think about what's going on not only in soybeans, but now also in corn, we have to be very careful about listening to where, what's happening in different parts of the country and how is this gonna impact both corn and soybeans. So my next slide, is a, a soil moisture map. Now this is again, satellite imagery taken by NASA. And again, they've, they've tried to ground truth this process, the, the imagery given the information we have in your US and they extend it to other countries. So the NASA has got satellites that are flying over. They do the satellite imagery for not only rainfall, but also evapotranspiration. They make some estimates or calculations of what is the soil moisture in this, for this graphic, in the top three meters, or top one meter, which is about three feet of soil. So think of that as, as kind of the root zone. So this is a photo of kind of the entire South America. On my next slide, what I've tried to do is highlight with this little triangle, that black triangle, the major growing region for corn and soybeans in Brazil. So when we, again, talking about weather conditions and about soil moisture conditions, and in particular now about um, La Nina. So La Nina is the dry spell that we tend to see impacting, negatively impacting Southern Brazil and Argentina. If you look at where the red zones are now in Southern Brazil and into Argentina growing region, which I'll show you in a moment, those areas are starting to be on the dry side. But for soybean planting and for corn planting, at least first crop, realize those red zones are areas that are just being seeded or completed seeding. So the growing season really is very, very early. Um, as you all know, for, from agriculture up here, you know this is gonna be rainfall through the key reproductive stages later on that's gonna really dictate final yield potential. But this, as we talk about La Nina, the weather conditions and the amount of rain that might come, both in Brazil, which is this map, and then the next map, which would be Argentina, those that I've tried to circle kind of the core growing region in Argentina, we have this mixed bag. There are areas that are starting to turn very dry. People are getting really concerned about emergence and about what this means longer term, but it's only selected regions of their production zone. Some of the core production regions like the north for Mato Grosso in Brazil, as well as the southern regions as you get closer to the Atlantic Ocean can help offset some of these drier conditions. So right now, yield expectations have not changed a lot, but the weather and the weather patterns are being watched very, very closely. So with that, I'll finish off and hand things off to Tim, um, unless there's any questions that come in, in the next couple minutes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, if there is a question, just go ahead and take a frame. But uh, uh, we go ahead and get going with my presentation on the first slide here. Since I last talked to you a month ago, we've seen really nice improvement in uh, feeder cattle prices and uh, not unexpected because if you go to the right hand side of that chart, you see uh, uh, last year's in purple and then 2019 in green, we have those Vs usually in mid-October. And then after mid-October, we see some improvement. And uh, this year, no exception. We hit our lows there in mid-October. And then we are going, uh, you know, moving back up. In fact, when I talked to you last time, the previous weekly average was 166 on these 550 to six weight calves. And last week was 180, uh, 44. So uh, they, they've just been going up seasonally. And uh, uh, a number of reasons for that right away there, 
but you know, by mid October, all of a sudden the big runs hit the PG checking kind of get over and, and the calves go to town and they're typically not weaned and uh, all of a sudden big bunches come in. And uh, then the further out we go, then the more they might be uh, weaned and have a little more time away from being a balling calf and so on and many other things. The, the uh, winter wheat crop, uh, you know, comes on and so there's winter wheat grazing. So that stimulates demand, particularly in the Southern Plains, but it affects prices all over. And, uh, and another big thing is that uh, later on here after the Corn Belt, I'm talking the Iowa and Southern Minnesota feedlots, uh, they, you know, they grow a lot of corn and, and uh, they wait to buy calves until they get the combining done. So when the combining gets done by mid-October or late in there, they come in and they really, really spark the market, particularly in Eastern markets here. West Fargo is closed now, but we'd see that every year. But you go down to Aberdeen and in there, when, when those farmer feeders hit the seats, the the uh, year-round cattle buyers that are buying for the Colorado and Nebraska lots, they kind of have to sit on their hands because those farmer feeders down there are, are aggressive. They like high quality uh, cattle and, 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 and they bid. So we saw that, the, you know, the harvest wrapped up and they're back on the seats. That sparked the market. And uh, yeah, and, and some bigger things that we're going to talk about now is that we have fewer numbers. The calf crop has went down for three years and I've got a some Canadian issues I'm going to talk about. And then, you know, the the uh, other market classes above them, you know, feeder cattle can go higher if uh, backgrounded cattle go higher and backgrounded cattle can go higher if the fed cattle. And so we're going to talk about that, but a little bit longer than uh, going to the left hand side of the chart. You see, we're already up to where we started there in 2018 and we expect better prices, uh, you know, up there uh, throughout the year, better than the last actually four years that are on the chart now. So, you know, barring some emergency, uh, you know, Frayne talked about corn and, and the DS 22 corn futures are 35 cent below the current DS contract and, and, uh, you know, uh, good crops in the, in the South there that he talked about and so on. So again, uh, our, our corn crop is going to be a big thing and that fits into calf prices and change corn 10 cents a bushel, change calf price a dollar in the opposite direction. So like he said, you know, comes as we get closer to spring, things are going to get volatile on the corn side. And the same thing is going to be on the feeder cattle side. But, the, you know, it looks like now we'll have uh, uh, even a better year next year. So go to the next slide. Then, uh, uh, you know, calf prices have went up. And so how does that fit into backgrounding? And anyway, we've got higher feed than we had last year and we're short of feed. And so maybe some still making the backgrounding decision. So uh, five of us went ahead and put together a backgrounding series of, of uh, videos and uh, just uh, the website is showing up there easiest, I think, just a background, just to just to Google uh, Ag Hub, NDSU Ag Hub backgrounding or something and not put in the whole thing. But Brian that just got through talking to, he did uh, budgeting for steers and heifers, uh, different gains. And Jerry Stucker talked about health, health issues. I did the outlook and, and, and some risk management and what LRP is doing. And Carl Hoppy did this year, of course, we're, we're short of hay and, but we did have a lot of silage and, and corn is high price. So Carl talked about other, how, how do we have a, a silage ration, for instance, maybe use some DDGs or, or something and in some non-traditional ba backgrounding. And then Zach uh, finished up with a ration. So, well, let's move ahead to the uh, next slide here again you on the right hand side you see now our calf crop has been down three years so that's supporting prices and into the next year's calf crop the cow herd is continuing to go down with the drought so we're going to have fewer calves next year that's all supportive to prices so go to the next slide uh, another thing that's happening is uh, kind of an interesting for us up here in North Dakota is following Canada because for many years in the fall of the year, uh, uh, you know, some producers were concerned because feeder cattle came down from Canada and competing with our cattle and into went to feedlots and so on. But now uh, 
the uh, cow herd in Canada has continued to go down. Go to the bottom chart there. The, the dark blue is the U.S. So, yeah, we took numbers quite down for eight years into 2014, but then we expanded back up. And so by 2019, we were the same as 10 years ago on the cycle there in numbers. But the gray is Canada. And you see they were down into 2014, 15 as well. And they just kept on going down. So they got fewer cattle. So now the tide is turned and we're sending feeder cattle up to, to Canada, 40,000 or more a month and, and compared to very, very few you know, years ago. And so that's sparking the market here uh, as well uh, because they're uh, uh, buying them at our Northern market. So go to the next slide. Uh, here are the heavier weight cattle. And again, when those prices go up, remember I told you uh, a month ago when I talked to you, the average 550 weight prices, there were 166. But now those spring futures, those March, April uh, futures are up there about 170. So for eight weight cattle, so that's actually higher than calf prices were back a month ago. So that helped spark the calf market as well, because, you know, from our backgrounding, then we can uh, actually, we can do a 170 LRP livestock risk protection, or you, you can do an option or futures, whatever you want to into the end of those months. And so those higher prices uh, brought the brought the calves right along. And then again, longer term, by the time we get to next fall at this time and, and into the, you know, the November futures and stuff for next year up there at, at 180, you know, compared to our 162.35 right now. So, it, you know, we look for better times ahead in the com cattle complex. And the thing that's driving these higher um, 758 prices are fed cattle that we'll go to next then fed cattle prices are sparking as well and that means that feedlots can pay more for given keeping corn constant uh, they can pay more for feeder cattle and so there again you've you've seen these before but that red line is this year's fed cattle uh, cash price it's just continued to inch up we did have a backlog that we had to get through but uh, there about a little over a month ago uh, almost two months ago now then the, we got the the backlog down and the packers uh, had to get out and get after uh, cattle again and and uh, get more aggressive so you see that spark there from way down there 122 123 to last week we we're over averaging over 140 and uh, and so you know what's important it depends on those heavier weight uh, 800 pound steers are going to finish in April or so and so you see April uh, futures there those orange squares were up there at 142 so that's why we had uh, the prices that we do for those 800 pounders and and uh, you know fed cattle futures for the entire year until right at the end of the uh, next year uh, similar to what they are now but significantly above last year and so that's uh you know what feedlots can do to lock in prices for fed cattle coming out so that helps the feeder cattle as well and then even go on the left hand top there we even have 2023 futures up there in the mid 40s for uh mid 140s for fed cattle so it looks like every year go going up so uh some of the things we can go to the next slide but the things that are helping fed cattle are what Brian just talked about is in the macro, the uh, uh, unemployment is going down to levels. People are working. Uh, beef is relatively high price, so people have to have jobs, but the, the, there's, the market there is positive, and so our domestic demand is strong. And then the other thing is, again, we're doing record export demand. The new numbers for October just came out yesterday. We set an all-time record high for uh, beef and, and also our competing that I, I don't have a chart for. For, but we, we've got record exports of, of chicken, pork and beef and you know for the competing meats if we export them we don't have to eat it here so that's all positive just uh, so we're going to do record high exports this year on the bottom one of the reasons for that is the uh, big um, amount of meat that we're sending into China 
and uh, they went to nothing in uh, in the first couple months of 2020 until we in phase one agreement went in and now they're our, our third best customer. A lot of reasons for that and I do have to move along and there, you know, there are issues there. Uh, one of the reasons why we've gotten so much into China is because of the BSE cases in Brazil and they China cut them off and, and Argentina that Frayne talks about had high inflation on beef and so they restricted him uh, 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 exports and so, uh, you know, this isn't a guarantee that it's going to continue but uh, it, that's really helped us out and anyway we're going to do record exports and the prediction for next year is that we will continue to do record exports but I but you know China is kind of a big grill in the room and uh, right now they're, they're the Olympics are coming up and we've decided not to send diplomats we are going to let the athletes go over there and so China isn't too happy about that as long with some other countries and they're strong arming Taiwan and we're siding with Taiwan and so you know politics are always a concern here that that would and, and of course we're sending lots of corn and beans to China too so those are a concern but as of now the Fed the cattle market fed cattle on down to calves is is sparking and doing better and our expectations giving some catastrophic event is that to continue for the next several years so with that we'll go to Ron and talk about some crop insurance oh I, yeah there we go Okay, hey, thank you, Tim. Uh, good afternoon. I just wanted to uh, uh, update you on a, on a few crop insurance changes that that, are, that uh, came down the pike here just recently. And um, so, my first slide. Then, um, basically, it's the haying and grazing area. The USDA uh, RMA is making it permanent. This new provision. Now, it's permanent until it's changed again, but it's permanent as of now. Um, that allows producers to hay, graze, or chop cover crops and still receive a prevented planting payment. So the next slide. Now, if you remember last July during the drought, uh, uh, it was concerns that they wanted to, to um, uh, hay or graze some of the prevent plant acres that had cover crops. And in July then, they announced that they could actually do that and still receive 100% of the prevent plant payment. Previously, the old rule was you could not do anything until after November 1st. Otherwise, you got penalized 65% of your prevent plant pay payment, which was a big blow. So people really, uh, it, it kind of prevented people from e doing anything. So this is a permanent change now. Uh, they're reacting uh, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the producers. So next slide, um, it, it also recall that there was a, a pandemic cover crop uh, program that helped maintain cover crop systems, uh, uh, I think it was a $5 payment. And uh, that, was, uh, that was implemented through the uh, RMA, through the crop insurance. Another change, next slide, is the prevent plant four in one requirement. Back in 2020, RMA implemented a policy uh, that land, land eligible for PP, prevent plant, the acreage must, must have been planted, insured, or harvested at least one of the four most recent crop years. They've, they kind of, they've kind of uh, narrowed that down. There was always some controversy, but they, they put it in writing, a four in one requirement. Now there's some more flexibilities added to that to recognize different farming practices. So the next slide, um, these are the new flexibilities. So one of, uh, that includes the if you have annual growth of an insured perennial crop such as alfalfa or red clover, uh, that would be considered planted. Also, uh, if you have a nap, uh, if you have a crop that's covered under nap, the, the uh, non-insured crop disaster assistance program, that will meet the uh, eligibility requirement. And um, also, if, uh, if neither crop insurance nor NAP was available for this crop, but you, you prove that it was planted and harvested using uh, proper practices for two out of the last four years, then that would meet your requirement. Okay, the last change now then, it deals with organics. And there was always some controversy on the different terms being used. 
So uh, they were, so they they tried to be consistent and, and 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 get the get that terminology right so there was no confusion uh, about uh, within the various programs uh, organic programs and uh, and labeling with USDA. So with that, then um, also there's a couple changes. Um, RMA is providing an option for producers. To to delay measurement of their of their stored of farm stored production for 180 days, okay. They also added earlage and snaplage as an acceptable measurement. Uh, if if you remember back during that uh, that drench show, I think it's how it's pronounced. Uh, that big wave of, of of rain that hit Iowa, um, a lot of people salvaged their their corn crops by by earlage or snaplage. And, uh, and that was a way of, uh, they allow that as a measurement now. And lastly, uh, I want you to make sure and contact, if you have questions regarding this, make sure and contact your crop insurance agent or FSA for, uh, to, get the, the, to get the further details. So with that, I will turn it over to David. Great, thanks, Ron. I have just some uh, brief comments about some developments in the last two days regarding uh, the RFS, uh, again, which mandates biofuel use in the United States. There was an announcement from uh, EPA regarding what the renewable volume obligations for 2020, 2021, and 2022 would be. Uh, those numbers are important because they tell us uh, how much total biofuel needs to be used by different categories. Uh, corresponding with that, there was also an announcement regarding small refinery waivers, which I've talked about recently. Uh, and just a little bit of detail. So this is this is kind of different than what, uh, or the same as Ron had mentioned. So on Tuesday, uh, EPA finalized the numbers for 21 and 22 and revised the final numbers from 2020. So it makes you wonder how final they were. Uh, and then it also is raising a question for the industry, are any numbers ever final? Uh, you know, 22 has long passed and those numbers were, were finalized and in the books for quite some time. Uh, so the question is, how, how might those change in the future? I uh, Just looking at some of the numbers and the real, the real focus in this is on the, the corn ethanol numbers. And what we saw was a reduction in 2020. The, the math you have to do by taking the difference between the total amount of fuel a total renewable fuel and the advanced biofuel to calculate the conventional biofuel numbers. That's essentially the corn ethanol number. Uh, although there's no mandate, and this is really important, there is no mandate, there's never been a mandate to use corn ethanol in the United States. Uh, there's a spot that works relatively well for corn ethanol, but it, it's not manned by any extent. Anyways, that conventional biofuel pot, which corn ethanol typically dominates, uh, was reduced from the number of 15 billion gallons, which is the same number in the original law, down to 12 and a half billion gallons. So if you think about that, that's a significant number of gallons that uh, won't have to be used or at least have RINs uh, generated for uh, for that year. Uh, going forward, the number you know for this year is less than the mandated number or the, the number in statute that 15 billion. And then going into next year, it, you know it does rise back up. Uh, you know, this is interesting and kind of continu continues this practice that we've seen uh, with EPA, which is adjusting uh, those numbers to actual use. Uh, again, last year we had COVID, this year we have COVID, uh, transportation fuel use, gasoline use went down. And so here we're adjusting those numbers. Uh, so, you know, I've mentioned it before, often in the last decade as different administrations have tinkered with the policy, the law itself says that you can only change the numbers because of economic harm or inadequate supply. And supply is not demand. So uh, more liberties taken by EPA uh, this, this time under the new administration. Uh, the good news, there's actually two pieces of good news in this. Uh, in, in, at the same time as the announcement was made in terms of those numbers being shrunk, uh, the EPA did deny 65 applications for small refinery waivers. So those are waivers by smaller refineries uh, to not have to uh, participate in the program at all uh, based on, on hardship. Uh, there was a number of gallons, uh, you, know, you know, billion gallons plus that were part of those potential exemptions. And so this might be a trade between getting rid of those exemptions, but also just getting rid of that, that total requirement. 
Uh, at the same time, USDA did announce that they are awarding $800 million to the industry, to the corn ethanol industry, uh, because of COVID-19. This is something that was actually part of the, the March uh, stimulus bill. Uh, and it finally came out, uh, you know, the, the, the checks will be, be out shortly, uh, again, responding to those losses. And then finally, we're ready for some questions. Uh, again, if you'd like to uh, use the chat feature uh, or the Q&A feature, that would be great. And I actually have a question for Tim. Uh, you may not know Tim, but there's a new Guinness uh, Book of World Records record. Uh, the largest vegan burger ever was cooked in Ireland, in Northern Ireland this week. And so my question for you is, what did they do with the ham, with the burger? Not hamburger, a vegan burger. What did they do with it when they were done? They threw it out. <laughs> no, they gave it to homeless people who oh. then threw it out. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yep. All right. It looks like we do have, uh, a, oh, it's just a thank you for the information, which is, which is appreciated as well. Are there any questions for any of the panelists? I would mention one thing too with, with Brian's talk. Uh, we're actually inter interviewing for a new macro uh, economist to serve on the faculty in our department. And I had a conversation with one of the candidates earlier today. He happens to be uh, uh, from another country originally. And we're just, I just asked him about inflation, what he thought could happen. One of the things he did bring up that could happen is that we may just have new expectations for what inflation is. So a, a lot of the thought is it's going to go back to what it was someday, somehow. The other possibility is that inflation, just the expected rate of inflation becomes 4%. I thought that was an interesting comment. As it appears, there's no questions. Do any of the other panelists have any questions or comments for, for anyone else? Uh, if not, I want to thank everybody for joining. We'll be back next month uh, after the next WASD report. Uh, so I, I hope you can join us then. Uh, you should be able to find a recording of this webinar and the slides on the URL uh, on the screen, as well as those from previous webinars. Uh, and with that, I want to wish everybody uh, happy holidays, and I hope you have a, a safe, enjoyable Christmas season. Thanks. Mm -hmm.